And you can see that clearly in my tape, African Evidence That Demands an African Verdict. I actually got it right there, the pyramid text of ancient Egypt where all of the sacred writings were copied and stolen from and put in what we now call the Bible. Right out of the pyramid of Teti the first in Saqqara. Did y'all hear that madness? He says that all of the sacred writings of ancient Egypt, I of the pyramid text, is copied into what you know as the Bible. He says also he also says that it came that that the sacred writings, which can be found in Saqqara, Egypt, the tomb of Teddy the First, he says that those writings, all of them, not some, not most, not few, not some hints, he said all of it is stolen from what you now call the Bible. That's a bold claim to make. He ain't the only one that's making this, these claims. And it sounds so good until you actually look into the research and be like, he lying. He's lying. So, I'm Judah Moshe in Israel. I have a documentary on YouTube. We we'll have three of them. Well, one of them got banned. It's called Kemet versus the Bible on Trial. Kemet versus the Bible on Trial. For those of you who are watching this, Kemet is what you now know today is Egypt. So what I did was I put the Bible on trial and I bring up the claims that are being brought against the Bible and refuted it. You know, I wouldn't even, you, it's, 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 it's no comparison. These people are lying. So people who follow Ray Hagins and people who follow the, that school of thought, I challenge you, pull up the pyramid text online, pull up any text and let's run a comparison without you changing the topic, without you putting up some YouTube video, Without you telling me what somebody else said, you pull it up, prove it. So in the picture, you saw a beautiful little girl who has the Egyptian Book of the Dead, okay, in one hand, and then she has the Bible headed toward the trash can. And why do you think that is? Because for many years, for many years, people have been making the assertion that the Bible, the entire Bible mimicking the Egyptian Book of the Dead, or the Papyrus of Ani. Okay, so you have people that's making these claims, but nobody's actually going into the actual book and running the comparison at all. Now, I've been waiting for that. Who's going to do it? Because you have many people who teach this, such as John G. Jackson. Now, remember, people call him a master teacher. I had a brother by the name of Heru Sarah who also said that nonsense to me. And um, he mentioned John G. Jackson. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you the screenshot of Heru Sara, what he said, and then we're gonna run the clip by John G. Jackson. And we'll also run the clip by um, Dr. Ben, who's considered a master teacher. Okay, Dr. Ben Yakanai, who learned from a man by the name of George G.M. James. Okay, so check it. Let's go ahead and see. The Christians took the whole Christian Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament, out of the Egyptian Book of the Dead. So that if you want to go to the source, don't go to King James. Go to ancient Egypt and you've got a Bible that's 10,000 years older than anything that these Christians have.
Where did the story of Jesus start? It started 4,100 years before Jesus. It started with the story of Isis and who became pregnant by an immaculate conception, gave birth to her son Horus by a virgin birth. Horus, who at the age of 12, removed himself from his population and went further south into Egypt at the Grand Lodge of Luxor. At the age of 30 he returned and at the age of 33 he was murdered, cut up into four, uh, 14 pieces and so on and so on. If you look in what is called the Egyptian Book of the Dead and the Papyrus of Annie, you would see the same story. Now, this man is considered a master teacher, Dr. Ben. His brother here. He's considered a master teacher. And he said that the Egyptian Book of the Dead... And the papyrus of Ani, which we say have the complete papyrus of Ani, you can find that story. That's a damn lie. He's lying. He lying. Remember this scroll was discovered in 1888 by a white man by the name of E.A. Wallace Budge, also known as Sir E.A. Wallace Budge. And remember the same man, Dr. Ben, if you get this book here, you can get on PDF, Mother of Western Civilization, on page 559. He acknowledges E.A. Wallace Budge. Let's see what he says. In fact, look at this. I'll show you here. See here? Look at that. So, I'm going to read what he says really quick. And I talked about this in my documentary. Uh, Kemet versus the Babylon trial. He says, I must need say that some of the most famous and highly rated Egyptologists of all time, such as Sir E.A. Wallace Budge, right? You notice he acknowledged him that. Sir E.A. Wallace Budge, this man here. Okay, you want to learn more about that? Watch Kemet versus, uh, versus the Babylon trial. I believe that was in part one. But I uh, remember um, the man who I'm speaking about, Dr. Ben, uh, Dr. Joseph Ben Yanahan, he learned from this man, George G.M. James, all right, who wrote the book Stolen Legacy. But anyway, um, in this Egyptian Book of the Dead, because remember, he's trying to run a comparison between the Egyptian Book of the Dead and the Papyrus of Ani. So in here, I'm going to show you what I'm about to read real quick. That highlight part right there. Uh-oh. We got problems. Remember this in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. See that? Egyptian Book of the Dead and the complete papyrus of Ani. Just like he talked about, right? But what's funny is that when you go in here, it says Egyptian religion, meaning worship, was not one of revelation. Its doctrines or what? Teachings were not ascribed. A-S-C-R-I-B-E-D. What that word mean? It was not ascribed. Hmm. What that mean? It was not ascribed to anyone divinely inspired. Intermediary. I N T E R M E D I A R Y. That's a link between. And teacher, teacher comparable to Christ, Muhammad, or Buddha. So that means this ain't no link between, nor can you compare it to people like Christ or anyone divinely inspired. Wow. So that means we've been lied to. We have been lied to. Hmm. Wow. Isn't that something? So, looks like Dr. Benyadahan was lying. If you say I'm lying... Prove it. The challenge is up for you to go ahead and prove it. Because he lied to you. He lied to you. The next nonsense I'm calling out is from a man by the name of Shaka Amos, who's the founder of the Nile Valley Movement. Uh, this is a book he has here that I spoke about in my documentary titled Kemet vs. the Bible on Trial. This is a book called Codex Game Over. And 
he attempted to try to link the Bible in with the pyramid texts, all right, such as the pyramid of Unis. All right, um, some of the things he said uh, that the writings came from um, Pepe II and his granddaughter Neat. Um, so this is called Cortex Game Over. Uh, a little bit about what he says on the back. He says, I'm going to put it up on the screen too, here. He says, uh, many have made claims over the years that the precepts and worldview upon which the Bible was founded were taken from the Africans of the Nile Valley, particularly those of ancient Kemet, Egypt. He says, never before, that's the key word, never before has literary evidence have been uncovered and revealed to this extent, substantiating the aforementioned claims. So letting you know, he's saying that ain't nobody done this yet. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, you got people who've been making these claims. He said nobody has gone to these great lengths to prove what he's about to prove in this book. So he says, the author, independent research specialist, Shaka Amos, founder of the Nile Valley Movement, definitely proves, shows, and illustrates for the first time in history the length to which the Bible editors and compilers copied, pleasurized, pleasurized, and stole astrological ideas and concepts from the literary repository of the Africans of the Nile Valley civilization off the walls of the old kingdom pyramids of ancient Egypt were they stolen. So here it is, he's trying to run a claim and said that it's stolen, copied, and plagiarized, right? If you watch my documentary titled Kemet vs. the Bible on Trial, I blew this book out the water, out the water. Starting by with doing the same thing he said that he did. Pulled up the pyramid text online, which you can do. When you watch my documentary, Kimmy vs. the Bible on Trial, I'll show you how to go and find a pyramid text, the same one he's looking at. Um, and showing how he took it out of context, took various words, and then breaking down why uh, certain words was in the brackets and parentheses and showing how the translations by Samuel B. Mercer, showing how it couldn't even be textually verified. So there's a lot of things that I cover in that documentary. So I just want to make the long story short. But anyway, let's see a little bit about um, the. I mean, let's look at a little bit of what Shaka Amos is saying. All right. Uh, so if you want some good laughs and get this little comic book, go ahead and get it online. It don't cost that much. Watch my documentary and watch how I blow it out the water. Blow it out the water. I'm trying to tell you. All right, but Shaka Amos. Hotep, everyone. My name is Shaka Amos. I am the uh, author and the compiler, or the collator, rather, which is the correct term. This is a collation. A collation is when you take one text and you place it alongside another text so that you can compare and contrast the two texts. And what I did with Codex Game Over, I took the original ancient Egyptian slash African text which is the pyramid text, and I put them alongside the biblical verses from Psalms, uh, 1 John, 2 John, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, so on and so on, uh, the Synoptic Gospel, the Old Testament and the New Testament. I took verses out of those particular books and I placed them alongside the Egyptian text so that you can see where the Bible verses came from. They came out of the original Egyptian text, the pyramid text, the coffin text and the Peter Imheru or the book of coming forth by day. So otherwise known as the Egyptian book of the dead, misnomer the Egyptian book of the dead. So in this book, in this small text, you have a large, vast, uh, a wealthy amount of information that will allow you in any dialogue uh, with a religious person or with a uh, with a Christian, uh, with a with a Muslim, with a Jew, uh, or Hebrew Israelite, whomever, whatever, have, whatever denomination any one of these persons may subscribe to, be it Seventh Day Adventist or uh, Jehovah's Witness or what, what have you. Look him up, Samuel B. Mercer. His pyramid text are available to read online. So if you Google Pyramid Text Samuel B. Mercer, you will see his Pyramid Text come up online and you can read them. You can go right to the index. 
okay? They are featured on a website called sacredtext.com, a very, very special website that was put together by a very special man who is no longer, um, uh, who is no longer with us, so to speak. He's no longer li living. Passed away a few years ago. Okay, so yes, you can go and look at the translations online, which I do talk about in my documentary. So I wanted you all to see that. So when you go and watch the documentary, Kim vs. the Bible on trial, I show you how to maneuver through the website, how to look up the translations and um, the commentary and what on what the translations is about, which is really good. You got to see that. Uh, also, um, I want you all to look at the next clip and pay very close attention because he's going to state that he did not use the translation of R.O. Faulkner. R.O. Faulkner is who you know is Raymond R.O. Faulkner. All right. Now, so in his book, he clearly does state that he did use the translation of Faulkner's and Mercer's. All right. Would you look at the very top? It says, the very top, it says, the content in this book, quite possibly the first of the of two more to follow, was collated by myself over the period of approximately six to eight months. It says the entire process of reading two various translations of the pyramid text, Faulkner's and Mercer's, and seeking out the corresponding biblical verses took me all together eight to nine months. Now, again, I thought that that was really strange that he is going to sit there and lie and say that he did not use Faulkner's translations. And guys, he actually did. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you something really quick. And I hope that you all are able to see this because once again, this guy is literally lying. It's like, did you think that we wasn't going to go ahead and look up this? For example... Claim 34. Look at Claim 34. Okay. You see that right there? Um, all old folk in his translation. See that in parentheses? He says he didn't use it. Right? So when you see, when you get this book, you see that what he's saying is a lie. But let's see how he says he didn't use folk in his translation. Uh-oh. You lied, brother. The Mercer translation was followed by the R.O. Faulkner translation in 1969, which is considered the standard today. Okay? Put it on there because I want them to see that. Put it on uh, uh, screen. I'm going to show it to you right here at the bottom of the first column. The Mercer translation was followed by the R.O. Faulkner translation in 1969, which is considered the standard today. Now, before we move on, put it back on me. I'll just say me. Um... Before we move on, I want to let you know, even though R.O. Faulkner's translation is considered to be the standard, I did not use his translation because his translation is more corrupt than they would let you believe, than they would tell you, than what you know. I have a study here that I'm going to show you later on to prove it, to document it, that R.O. Faulkner's translation, even though it's considered the standard, it is very corrupt. There are intentional changes in his translation that were put there purposefully in order to separate the ancient Egyptian origins of the biblical literature. He was an agent sent in to sterilize the ancient Egyptian text. Okay, that's why I don't use Mercer's translation. Okay, so now we clearly see that this brother definitely lied. He did use the translation. So um, go ahead and watch the documentary, Kevin vs. the Bible on Trial. Part one, part two, and if you get a hold of me, I can send you part three. And watch as these lies get blown out of the water. Just people making claims, making stuff up, but but don't even never go and try to show it. All they do is talk a good game, mislead you on, and now here it is. You following this nonsense too. Please be diligent in your research. Look this information up and do your due diligence. All right? But... Watch the documentary, Kimmy vs. the Bible on Trial. Once again, it's long, but it's worth it. Shalom. I recently published a 20-page online article entitled Asher Kwesi Exposed, as well as an online documentary called Asher Kwesi Refuted. Within these responses to Ashra, several websites offered Ashra $1,250 in cash if he could provide primary documentation 
for many of his claims about the alleged similarities between horse and Jesus. Ashra has yet to offer a single response to any of my letters, articles, or the cast challenges. And I am now extending the same cast challenge to Pastor Ray Hagens and his fans. I'm going to warn you from the start of this video. If you see what I'm going to show you, you will no longer be able to believe anything Mr. Hagens says regarding ancient history. Following shortly, I will provide you with a thorough refutation of all of Mr. Hagens' claims about ancient gods that allegedly resemble Jesus. The two websites in the description section will offer $1,250 in cash to anyone if they can provide a single primary text that indicates any of the following claims. That Horse was born on December 25th, that he was born of a virgin, that his birth was accompanied by a star in the east, that three kings followed the located and adorned the newborn savior, that at the age of 12 he was a prodigal child teacher, that he was baptized at the age of 30 and thus began a ministry, that he had 12 disciples, that he performed miracles such as healing the sick and walking on water, that he was known by many gestural names such as the truth, God's anointed son, the good shepherd, or the lamb of God, that he was crucified, and that he was buried for three days and thus resurrected. For Krishna, you can claim the prize money if you can show any text that indicates that he was born of a virgin, that a star in the east signaled his coming, that he performed miracles with his disciples, or that he was resurrected. And there are many, many more, and you can go read them for yourself, but I'm going to move as quickly as possible here. Keep in mind that you only have to prove one of these claims to get the prize money. In fact, the reason why this money is being offered to you is that we are absolutely positive that the more you research these claims for yourself, the more you are going to find that they emphatically aren't true. Let me give you several cases in point. Hagen's claims that Krishna was born of a virgin through his mother Devaki. <laughs> was born of a virgin. Her name was Devaki. This is found absolutely nowhere in any ancient text. When you read the Bhagavad Gita, you will find that Devaki emphatically had seven other children with her husband before giving birth to Krishna. Edwin Yamauchi holds a doctorate of Mediterranean studies from Brandeis University and has taught at the Miami University of Ohio for over 35 years. He has studied 22 languages including Egyptian, Akkadian, Coptic, and Ugaritic. Received eight fellowships from Brandeis Records and elsewhere, published 200 articles and reviews in professional journals, lectured at more than 100 colleges and universities, participated in archaeological expeditions throughout the Middle East, and has written 17 books encompassing the ancient mystery religions in Africa. So in other words, when Mr. Yamauchi speaks, you would do well to listen to him. He states, quote, That's untrue. Krishna was born to a mother who already had seven previous sons, as even his followers will concede. The distinguished professor of Hinduism, Vasudha Narayanan, PhD, University of Bombay in India, concurs, quote, I've never heard of Krishna being born of a virgin, either through Sanskrit or the vernacular texts. I'm born on December 25th? Wow. The texts explicitly say he was born between August 15th and September 14th. Hagen's claims that Krishna was crucified. Krishna was crucified on a tree between two thieves. This is found absolutely nowhere in any ancient text either. The Bhagavad says he was killed after being shot in the foot by a hunter named Jara because he was mistaken for a deer. Hagen's often claims that the Gospels are the only source we have for Jesus. That the Jesus character is based upon much older myths. This character, Jesus Christ, was invented and did not depict a real person. Let's establish something, brothers and sisters. literary evidence follow me well now the only literary evidence to the existence of Jesus is what we call the Gospels this is patently false as any atheist scholar will tell you in fact, there are 39 non-biblical early sources that document the historical existence of Jesus. If you don't believe the Bible, then fine, we don't need to use it as a source. Would you believe the Roman historian Tacitus, who was not a Christian? Would you believe the Jewish historian Josephus, who was living at the time and wasn't a Christian? Would you believe the non-Christians Pliny the Younger, Suetonius, Celsus, Lucian, and Marabar Serapin? In the sidebar, I've included a short documentary by Chris White of NowhereToRunRadio.com that examines the ancient non-biblical sources for Jesus. If you watch it, you will no longer be able to doubt the existence of Jesus. In fact, we have the same number of early sources for Jesus as we do for the Roman Emperor contemporaneous with him. And although many of the early sources for Jesus criticize him heavily and try to refute Christianity, not even one attempts to claim that he never existed. The distinguished historian Michael Lacona states, quote, I am not aware of a single widely respected scholar in the world who holds the position that Jesus never existed, end quote. 
Hagen says that Horace was born of a virgin. Let me tell you something about Horace. <laughs> Who does I'm talking about now? Horace. Horace. Horace was bur- born of a virgin. This is easily shown to be false. The Egyptian texts all clearly indicate that Isis and Osiris had sex in order to give birth to Horse. This is reiterated in the Egyptian texts when Isis travels about the land finding the 14 severed pieces of Osiris' body. She fails to find his male organ because it has been eaten by a fish, so she then fashions one and has sex with his body to impregnate herself with Horse. This is reiterated through the generative symbol of the Osirian obelisk. Indeed, spell 366 of the pyramid text explicitly references to the inseminization of Isis by Osiris. Quote, Isis comes to you, Osiris, rejoicing for love of you, that her seed might issue into her. The coffin text, spell 148, concurs, quote, O you gods, I am Isis. Osiris, who judged the slaughterings of the two lands, his seed is within my womb. I am Isis, one more spirit like an august than the gods. The god Horus is within this womb of mine, and he is the seed of Osiris, end quote. In trying to fabricate similarities with Osiris and Jesus, Hagen says that Osiris was resurrected with the implication of Egyptian soteriology. Her, Osiris Horus was buried in a tomb and resurrected three days later. This is disingenuous. Either Hagen knows nothing about Egyptian eschatology or he is lying to us. Edwin Yamauchi states, quote, It's misleading to equate the Egyptian concept of the afterlife with the resurrection in the Christian tradition. The Egyptians believe that to attain immortality, the body has to be mummified, nourishment had to be provided, and magical spells had to be used. The Egyptian concept didn't entail rising from the dead. Instead, separate entities of the individual's personality, called the Ba and Ka, hover around his body. Gunter Wagner in his thorough study concurs, quote, Osiris knew no resurrection, but was resuscitated to be the ruler of the netherworld. Dr. Gary Hammerboss is professor of apologetics and philosophy at Liberty University and is one of the foremost authorities on the ancient mystery religions and has documented the largest analytical compilation of modern authorship of the pre-Christian obituary myths. He and Dr. J.P. Moreland of Biola conclude in their exhaustive research, quote, Not one clear case of any alleged resurrection teaching appears in any pagan text before the late 2nd century AD. In the sidebar and response bar, I've linked an excellent documentary that thoroughly examines and refutes every single claim Ray Hagens makes about astrotheology, the sun, the zodiac, and the many alleged parallels between various ancient gods and Jesus. I have also provided an excellent article for those of you who wish to dig deeper. When you do, you will find that Mr. Hagen's sources are not from respected academicians, but from widely refuted hoaxers like Timothy Freak, Peter Gandy, and Kersey Graves, all of which have been rebuked and refuted by atheist scholarship. I hope this cash incentive encourages people to research Hagen's claims without blindly believing in everything we are told. There is a carefully orchestrated plan at work here that the mystery school is called the externalization of the hierarchy. This plan would have you enslaved into the esoteric ideas, and I'm not necessarily saying that Hagen's is consciously in on it, but everything Hagen says originates from these sources. This can all be stopped if we simply research and question what we are told. Thank you for your time.